<laughs> get off me! Fucking get off me! You've been holding your breath your whole life. Oh god, I can fucking breathe. Yeah. Mm. And when you get ten great minds together who push and drive one another and keep one another accountable and powerfully embrace one another and become vulnerable with each other, the energy from that is indescribable. And the group is about uh, supporting each other, you know, to live conscious, full lives. What it comes down to is really being true to yourself. We come in every week with the intention of doing something bigger, doing something better, and how we can make an impact. Laughing Badger checking in. I'm pissed off. I'm in. Robert checking in. Um, I check in with sadness and fear, um, gratitude tonight. I'm in. Oh, oh, oh. Boy, so what's the risk I've been taking? Well, the of just being okay of, I don't know what's going to be next. You know, what does it mean to be a man in this society? Yeah, we're willing to risk, uh, you know, being vulnerable. Every meeting, you know, it's, there's a risk in showing up. And, you know, we have fear. And we lay it on the table. And, you know, hiding fear is it's kind of the old style of man. Oh, one, two, three. Oh, one, two, three. I'm fine to go, ugh. It's contrived. I know it is. I know it is. <laughs> well, that makes me angry too. One of my great fears is, you know. Can I, can I do it? How do you relate to other men? I didn't have anybody who could reflect to me my value. And these group of guys, you know, they fully embrace me. It's a feeling of trust and brotherhood. I want to be fully present for each of you guys. You can't take a prototype and say, oh, this is what the perfect man, the perfect father, the perfect husband looks like. It doesn't exist. Because we all have our own personalities. We all have our own strengths, we all have our own weaknesses. Chris, how are you disconnected from the earth? Thanks for all the space for me, for letting me express my feelings. Really, what do you want? The truth's gonna come up. Somebody's gonna say what's really going on with you. I so, I so wish I had started when I was younger. I didn't know, I mean, I just, the concept, of, I, didn't, I didn't get the concept of men's groups. Poof. 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 Oh. 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 Who's our leader next week? Who is our leader next week? Imagining yourself in a situation where you feel completely seen and just absolutely loved. Good morning. This is Boysen Hodgson with the Mankind Project USA. And I am doing an off-the-cuff interview with Maya Buga to ask about about men. So Maya, thank you for taking the time with me this morning, uh, bright and early here and not so early there. Thank you. The first question is, of course, the typical question, what was the inspiration for about men? Um, I heard a radio interview with Owen Marcus, who started the group that I filmed for About Men, uh, two years ago, an online blog talk radio, um, where he mentioned his men's group, and he explained what it was about, uh, and I think the interview was more on the take, the, the de development of masculinity and how it's changing in society, um, and then he, of course, was referring to it and exemplifying things with his men's group. And then I emailed him and contacted him because I thought it sounded really interesting. And I was always interested in gender and especially masculinity. So after uh, I had written my bachelor's degree in Denmark four or five years ago about masculinity in Europe um, with point of departure in a, in a novel that I analyzed, a French novel by Michel Rubik. 
Um, and his character in his novel is very uh, alienated in a supposedly feminized or gender equal society in France. And he argues uh, that he needs to go to Middle East or to poor developing countries where he can find girls um, easier because he's, he simply thinks that it's gone too far in a feminized way so that men have no way of living life in France. <laughs> so uh, so I was always interested in that the last five years and how much men is changing, how men perceive themselves in society in terms of their gender and and gender equality, how that has developed with uh, with the women's movement and how that's impacting men. Um, so when I contacted Owen uh, and asked if he knew any men's groups in New York, because I was doing my degree in media studies there at that time. So it, it took me a year, and then I found this one group in New York, and they uh, allowed me in for one meeting and had a 45-minute big argument about me being there. Uh, because only it was only the one guy who started the group who took me there, and he didn't have the other guy's consent beforehand. Mm. So that wasn't such a great experience uh, for me either, but it ended up being a great short film that I did just of that meeting. One meeting, and I already there knew that it was such an intense, interesting concept, and it definitely said a lot of things about men and masculinities in our time. Um, and also because I saw my father's, uh, I kind of exemplify him in one of those in, in those men groups constellations and and the individuals, and I could see him um, be one of them them in terms of what they were struggling with and their family history or their individual their own personal history and what they've gone through, how they maybe were not so much in touch with their feelings. And my father had also been through a midlife crisis um, about eight years ago. And so that has all, had always so inspired me to dig into how men prepare themselves for life. Or because for me, it just seems that he just all of a sudden woke up one day and needed to leave everything. And he just, he just said, I spent the last 25 years on my family and now I'm almost uh, retiring. And then what? And it just almost dawned on him one day. And then he just had to, he quit his job and he left for Guatemala two months with the Red Cross. Um, and then he came back, got the same job, everything was fine. So to me, that just seemed a little weird, and I was just curious how that happened. And it totally, I totally saw him as the typical traditional man in that the gender theories and the masculinity theories were describing uh, as kind of not alienated, maybe, but um, not so sure where to, what leg to stand on and what position to take in society and the role and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Universality seems to be one of the themes that comes up when you start – you're talking about the kind of constellation of men's groups and all of this work, and then you can see your father from a very different possibly social context and see him in that. Talk a little bit more about the kind of universalities, because then you ended up in Sandpoint, Idaho – yeah. with Owen Marcus's men's group. So talk about that, men across cultures or yeah. what's universal. Yeah, well, I think that the – because I came from a theoretical point of view first into this, and I think that those are, of course, like all Western theory is very you – know, trying to embrace all countries, all Western countries under one umbrella. So, of course, it's superficial because in that sense you need to be able to view everything so it's simplified. Um, but you can also that that's kind of like it provides you a framework because it's so simplified for you then to read into. Okay, so the Danish way can take a little bit of this theory in that way, and then maybe the American country or the American states can um, will fit into the theory a little bit differently. Um, but it it kind of incorporates all Western culture from my perspective, or how I have, where I've been traveling and what I've seen. Um, and being in, in New York for three years and then in Idaho for that one month that I filmed, um, I have this hypothesis that in Denmark we, we are already a little bit more ahead in terms of gender equality than the U.S., and especially maybe the focus on men and having turned the, the focus onto men away from women because we are already so far ahead with the women equality and that some men think that it's gone too far. It's tipped the, the, over the middle to... So it's more advantageous to be a woman now. Um, I don't know about that, but um, there's definitely a, a change that I have witnessed growing up uh, and also between my parents that my mom was more maybe a powerful 
in most situations. But um, I think then coming to Idaho and experiencing these men and that men's group particularly, uh, they were very uh, ahead, if if I'm looking at it like that, that uh, they were very in touch with their own individual selves and because that's what they're doing in the men's group, of course. So they've been trained and they were used to looking at themselves from a critical or from an outside perspective or um, in a context and was able to put themselves in different contexts. So I thought that they weren't that different uh, from my culture in that sense. I could totally relate to all of their issues, all of their way of speaking about life and speaking about their personality. So I didn't feel any culture or language barrier except me expressing myself sometimes. But luckily, I was behind the camera, so <laughs> it was not me who should do the talking. It was them. So I, I felt like I understood everything they said and where they came from. And But then afterwards, showing the film, a lot of people were asking me, so why um, why is it only such rich, white, heterosexual men that you focus on? And I was like, well, I didn't even think about it, that I was doing that because, of course, it happened coincidentally. I didn't go out directly choosing it because it was the only group offering to be part of the film. Um, and also where I come from, they seem to be the majority because we don't have that many immigrants and we don't have that many, much variety and people are rich <laughs> so and, <laughs> and white. And so for me, that seems normal. Um, I didn't see that group to be not American um, because I haven't traveled that much in the U.S. And, and only later or only have people told me about the that by diversity there is in, in the U.S., and I probably have only seen the more richer part, yeah. I don't know if there were men's groups in more poorer communities, might be, and they might function differently, but uh, but it, it reminded me of a Danish um, culture, for sure. Mm. Yeah, so the particular demographic that you ended up in kind of matched what you were used to. Yeah. That makes sense. Was there anything... Um, you wrote an article for the Good Men Project called uh, – I don't remember the exact name, but it was something of what happened when, a, yeah, when this woman joined a men's group. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, was there anything that really surprised you stepping into that, as you said in the beginning? It yeah. tends to be a little bit secretive, a little bit off the rails. Um, yeah, it was surprising the level uh, or depth of uh, intimacy and vulnerability for sure. And I had read about that, that that was what they were doing. Um, and so I was surprised by how they so deep, so quickly came in touch with their inner feelings and how they it, how they were so good at expressing that and just cry. And, and just even though they were starting to cry or kind of, I would probably get confused in that situation, but then they were still able to talk and to articulate what it was about. And, and kind of move on and with the help from each other uh, dig deeper into what it was about and why that reaction was caused and how to work with that reaction and if it happens in the future, what do you how to. So they're able to practice that in the men's group and then take it into the real life afterwards because then they've known how, how to deal with it and they, it's not so scary anymore because they've tried it out. And the way that they can reenact with each other and play different roles for instance, one of the men was playing another man's father, and then they were playing it out in real time in that men's group meeting Wednesday night. Um, one man meeting his father, talking to him, and then simply starting off being really afraid and scared and angry at his father, and then an hour later um, having come over that and broke through all the anger that he had and then just embraced his father with love. And that was just amazing for me to see because it's kind of it's art in a way, and it's it's because it's artistic expression when you do kind of theater or role playing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that was really amazing uh, for me to see how you can use different uh, human um, connection to to help individual people reach through and yeah. So that's that's great. That's a great answer, and it speaks to something that kind of paradox, and I know Owen talks about paradox, the paradox between this kind of esoteric role play and the artistic expression that you were saying and the absolute pragmatism and practicality 
mm. of what they're doing. So, like, the intent is I want to make my life better. I want to be able to handle situations better. Exactly. Yeah. And then I was also surprised about um, that they weren't afraid at all to show anything. I think I also said that already. <laughs> but mm. but it, I could leave a, a, the meeting after having filmed them for those four hours every Wednesday, and then I would just feel so overwhelmed um, with emotions that I wasn't able to express it because I was supposed to film. So I, mm. I kind of had some kind of mask or barrier between me and the men, but it still did touch me in a very deep way that afterwards I could – cry and just talk to them and tell them how it, incredible it, it had been for me to experience, even though I rarely would give anything of myself to them. And so I, I, I felt really grateful that they would just give all of those feelings and let me uh, experience that and be part of that. And yeah. Nice. Some, uh, because of this uh, somewhat secretive or, you know, confidential, they create confidential spaces. Uh, women and men sometimes are very suspicious of men's groups, uh, you know, because they are secretive. So after having kind of gone behind the curtain and been inside, what kind of message would you deliver to somebody, a man or a woman, who's kind of afraid of what's going on there behind the curtain? Mm, well, I think that people just need to be better at accepting um, differences in general and different ways of approaching life and trying to really see the the other person and his interest and his experience um, outside of one's own experience. Um, yeah, it's a hard way to it's hard to explain, I think, because I also really learned that from being there that instead of judging other people and instead of letting my experiences and my way of looking at life, uh, instead of projecting that onto another person, really just try to listen to their experience of life um, and be better at empathizing with that and understanding that maybe that's not how I experience it, but that's how this person experiences it. And I can try to understand that as best as possible. And then not just try to judge it as saying, oh, this is soft men or this is hard men. Try to not put the things into boxes and simplify it, but really see one person as they are and then accept, well, if this men's group is working for men and that's why they're doing it and it helps them, then we should accept it. Then it's good for someone, somebody, some somewhere. And, mm -hmm. yeah. So, But I think it's good for a really, really good move that this group was, uh, was able to and interested in showing the world what it's about because there is so much mysticism or mystery about it and so many misconceptions and um, so I feel like there's definitely a need for people to see that it's very harmless and it's not about uh, bitching about women or being macho men together or uh, it's so personal that um, that the the wives and women if they saw what was going on in there of course they would be 100 percent accepting toward it it's just but i also see the point of that it only being men or being exclusive because it has to be so safe in order for the men so quickly and effectively be able to reach that level of, of vulnerability and in, in touch with their own emotions if there's just different people every week uh, and you don't trust those people it's harder to uh, to get in touch with those feelings quickly yeah. So I think we should just be, be better at accepting uh, every kind of way of socializing or getting together, and but also remember to communicate it to the outside world in a way that they will they will un understand it and accept it, even though they don't know everything. But <laughs> nice. Uh, as we were, thank you. As we were talking, you were talking about making a connection there in Denmark to a much more academic institution, much more academic uh, organization, and how excited they were about the film. Talk about the kind of bridges that you've been able to build as a result of it going into these two very different, to me, they seem very different things sometimes. We end up with a very academic silo about gender, about masculinity, you know, very heady. Mm -hmm. And then this kind of mystical, artistic, emotive process. Yeah. Talk about the bridges that have come about. Exactly. Well, also, the, my motivation for doing it with actual men, instead of writing another paper about what masculinity is, 
or what men might be like, I thought it was it, the best thing to do, go in there, go out there in the community, meet them, try to facilitate their story. Um, and I, I think that that has been my role throughout this process of being like the middleman between maybe an academic or definitely an outside world to the inside community. Um, and then keeping in touch with that community throughout the whole process of editing the film to making sure that they think uh, what I'm putting together is their story and their way of view- viewing their own self and life, even though it's scary to see yourself on a film. Um, and I think that's the most important thing because academics uh, do, as you said, work in a field that is um, uh, differentiated from the everyday life. And I think most people do know that, that there is a distinction between theory and real life, but of course that they're trying to to incorporate or trying to describe the real life. So I think visual images and um, and letting the people themselves speak is uh, the most powerful that we can do. And I think that's why documentary films are so successful and more and more people are wanting to make documentary films rather than writing a, a paper or an article and the technical equipment is getting so available too. So it's actually possible. And I think that uh, gender um, organization that is going to do the Danish premiere is interested because they know the power of those visual images and they really want to reach uh, men too so that they can prove to the Danish society and outside that they're not only focusing on women issues that they they of course think that this is really interesting because I'm a woman film, filmmaker making it um, mm-hmm. so that gives a whole other level but as a lot of the men from the men's group have said that probably this would never ha- have happened if I was a man because I, then I would uh, then I would have portrayed the men's group in a different way, or maybe I would just not have had the curiosity as I had, because I'm an outsider, both culture-wise, language-wise, and gender-wise, and that mm-hmm. gives me uh, maybe a more uh, or an easier way to distinguish and to look at it, maybe in a theoretical way or definitely in an abstract uh, way or in a different context, and and then really see it. Um, how how is this uh, just by itself? What what's the power of the personal story that these men have, and not necessarily try to compare it to uh, to theories, but letting the men themselves speak their truth. <laughs> now I'm mm-hmm. saying a word that they also use in the men's group: speak your truth. Uh, right. So I've incorporated their language for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's um, I think it's so important that we don't just get stuck in theories, but that all ways of in the media all debates about gender should be uh, rooted in some kind of reality where whoever if it's girls or boys or women or men they are um, speaking themselves and we are listening directly to their voice instead of writing several levels between the subjects and the message yeah that's great that's really great thank you um, talk about reactions that you – so you've been uh, sharing the film with individuals and with small groups. Mm-hmm. What kind of reactions are you getting? Um, I've screened it with mostly with friends and, and family and people who already have read a lot about the film or talked to me a lot in the process of making it. But I've also showed it to uh, some men's groups in Denmark and also a few people in the U.S., and uh, and the reaction is uh, really really great overall, and so I'm very surprised how people like it so much and that they really think it's touching. So that's really amazing um, because it was so touching being there. So that's my what I need to do as a filmmaker, of course, is to really portray that intimacy that I experienced in the film, and that it's possible for someone in a different country to view it and then get touched and maybe even cry. Um, they do get that maybe it's only five minutes, a feeling of what it would be like to be part of this community. And that's the point. And I think everyone has said that they've reached that and that they really want other people to see it. And especially the girls have said to me that now they can see how their father or boyfriend or some man in their life um, look at life or have gone through something. Now they feel like they've got a better perspective on that from viewing the film, which is great. So that's that also great. my hope, <laughs> that, of course, a lot of men will get to know that there's men's groups out there and that there is a way to get together with other men to figure out, just be better at living life 
and that you don't necessarily need a problem to get into a men's group, but that it's just something that everyone can take advantage of, and it's social just as much as it is uh, pushing and challenging, um, but that you definitely learn so much more about yourself and that it's, in the end, will always be a success. Um, of course, I spoke to a few people who had been part of the group and then went out of the group, and also Owen, who started the group, has said that it's not for all men and that yeah. some will never, maybe never feel ready, but some will feel re- ready at a different time. Um, but that it does take, I think it does take a certain kind of man or a, a way uh, in life, a certain position that you reach in your lifetime where you feel you'll be ready for things like this. Um, mm. But... Um, but yeah, the reaction has been really, really great, and a lot of people want a lot of people to see it. And then, of course, um, the biggest surprising, uh, greatest thing <laughs> I was told was uh, from um, the ma- the marketing director from Mankind Project in the UK, uh, Kennedy Cross. He said that he had had so many um, media come out and ask if they could do a documentary film of the men's group, and no men, yeah. no group have never said yes before. So. The, this group in Idaho allowing me to just come as a, at that time, very unexperienced filmmaker and a very uh, young student and a woman, and then just opening their doors to me and letting that out. Um, it's just something that has never been done before. So that's lucky for the film, I think. And uh, and it needs, I'm so glad that it was done. And ho- hopefully a lot of people will see the film. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well done. Well said. As the marketing director for MKP USA, I resonate a lot with what Kenny <laughs> with what <laughs> Kenny said as well. I've had conversations with numerous uh filmmakers and documentarians and TV show producers and you know BBC called me at one point, Discovery Channel called me at one point yeah. wanting wanting to go into our our the mankind projects weekend training the new warrior training adventure Mm -hmm. and uh institutionally we have said uh no i'm sorry you know there's just too much too much risk in terms of confidentiality and da 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 the fact that that owen was uh brave enough courageous enough and that those men were courageous enough to just kind of open the door i think really speaks volumes about who they are I also think it speaks volumes about the cultural changes that we're seeing. You said uh, earlier that there's just so much conversation right now about men and boys and masculinity, and the and uh, it's being integrated much more into the kind of feminist dialogue mm-hmm. that's been going on for so long. Talk about what you see as the future here for this dialogue. Um, hopefully. I hope to see that uh, we will have fewer people um, arguing against each other or standing uh, more or less shouting of each other from two different uh, opposing sides and that they think that either you're for or against or you're with the feminist or you're not a feminist or you're machinist or you're not, that all those wordings and uh, terms that we want to put on to who we are in terms of who we are supporting and what development we're seeing. I hope that those will be less important and that we will be able to see beyond those and come together so that men and women can talk together about both masculinity developments and femininity developments. And that um, also from Michael Kimmel's way of viewing it too, who I interviewed as well in my research, um, Yes, I think uh, fem- to be a feminist, you don't need to be a woman. And I think that that whole movement and that development that women have gone through the last 100, 200 years uh, could definitely benefit men and men's development. And I don't think we should view it as a, as a, something that's negative for men at all. Um, whether men should then take on the term and call themselves a feminist, I'm not sure about that, or if we should create new terms for it, more academic terms. But I think that... Um, and I do hope and see also slightly that men are being more open towards um, accepting themselves and looking at themselves critically. And you can call that a feminized development. Um, some people do that and they don't want it. But uh, I think it's great that people look into themselves and take a critical view and say, this is who I am. Where do I want to go? Uh, where have I been? 
and uh, and then where do I see myself in because of my gender in society and what is my role? Um, I hope that all men will will talk about that easily in the future, as well as women have been required to do uh, the last at least ten or twenty years. Mm. Very well said. Michael Kimmel talks about uh, masculinity being something that we have to prove over and over every day. Mm. And I see the Mankind Project. I see Sandpoint men's groups. I see a lot of what's happening out there as a movement away from that kind of masculinity. So whatever we want to call it, however we frame it, to me it's like – uh, the process has been I no longer have to prove constantly that I'm man enough. Yeah, exactly. I can just kind of – I can be. I can be in my emotions. I can be in, you know, whatever characteristics that that I want to call them. We don't have – I don't have to call them masculine or feminine labels. I don't have to use those labels. It's just me. It's me being me. Okay. And I think – that's good for all of us. Exactly, yeah. And I think uh, a lot of people have actually reacted to uh, to me posting about the film and the trailer on Facebook and on different men networks where the loudest voices are usually the ones that are angry at feminism <laughs> and yes. angry at me even being on a man's side uh, for being a woman. And then I'm not supposed to say anything in their form. Um, but uh, I think that they, they were – a lot of their voices were also – criticizing that the U.S. maybe is still more in a traditional that, and also what Michael Kimmel speaks about, that this behavioral masculinity that everyone has to be very tough and don't cry and um, don't be educated and don't be smart, um, and but be tough and cool. Uh, I definitely think that that's, um, and I agree with those men that when they say that that's not relevant uh, for Denmark. But still, uh, it's it's all connected when you make a film about a men's group. And even though they are not acting macho, it's still uh, part of the same talk. It's still part of masculinity developments. Where do we see it going? Where is it going? Where do we want it to go? Um, and, uh, yeah. So. Final question. What's next? Well, it would be really great to uh, to make a comparative uh, film with a uh, Danish men's group or maybe even with a mixed group or – a women's group and a men's group, and since I'm in Denmark, it would be here, uh, and I think that would be an interesting cultural study. So um, we'll see where it takes me if I am not too fed up with uh, with gender debates <laughs> at the end of this. Um, yeah. Yes, if we are not too fed up with gender <laughs> debates, yes. And I've been saying for a couple of years now, as soon as I enter, as soon as anyone enters into what they call the gender wars, we've all lost. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's just no winning, and uh, yeah, th- that outward focus, focus on somebody else's, somebody else is just not gonna get us anywhere. Yeah, exactly. I think so. Maya, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me this morning um, and this afternoon for you. (laughs) I wish you a lot of luck. I look forward to uh, working with you with the Mankind Project to have the film screened after you've gotten it into some – into some festivals and into some shows. I think that's going to be very exciting. I know that this will help. A lot of men's groups in the United States and elsewhere to say, take a deep breath and say, oh, yeah, it's really not that scary what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Let's invite let's invite other men yeah. <laughs> to, to just take this, take a little risk and and step into that kind of space. So thank you so much for taking the big risk that you took and for your perseverance and courageousness in making it happen. Thank you. I look forward. I really look forward to the collaboration too, and I hope that the Mankind Project will be able to use it, and that we can reach a lot of people together. So yeah. Great. Thank you.